Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. Now, over the weekend I asked y'all to send me jazz recommendations for today, which is International Day of Jazz. And there were quite a bit of standards. I was expecting very popular musicians. Just previously we checked out one of the requests, which was Kamasi Washington, which yeah, that's a fantastic name to include into any uh, look-through of jazz, especially where jazz is today. I was very surprised when my random generator gave me a request that said, Tomoya Otani, Arid Sands. I was told that this came from a Sonic soundtrack. I don't really know what to do with that information, but I found it interesting because I am in the middle of playing through all of the Sonic games myself. In fact, I just finished up most of the 2D Sonics. The only one left is Sonic Mania, and when I finish that up, I'll be moving to the 3D one, starting with Sonic Adventure and going towards Sonic Unleashed, which is what this is. So, uh... I was kind of apprehensive, <clears throat> but I've never been one to turn down a request, and I didn't want to check it out myself because you don't really get uh, that full first-time listen reaction if I already know it's coming up. So, as I've done many times in the past, I put my faith <laughs> in the community to steer me in the right direction. Sometimes it's not great. Other times it's full of surprises. I'm hoping for the latter today. Let's dive into this. The nighttime theme for, I assume, the Arid Sands level. Okay. Oh. Very groovy. Whoa. I wonder though if this is just going to be jazzy or if I'm going to say, no, this is a jazz track. Oh, what? <laughs> Very funky. Dude, that is a meaty bass tone. Oh, we have hand claps. Oh, so this is a repeat of the earlier solo. Oh, 
pulling out some of the body, some of the layers to give us that, uh, that spaciousness before punching back in with everything. Yeah, and this is the same solo we had. Okay. I like it. It just grounds everything down. Dude, the brass. That is a crisp stinger it really is i feel like there's so much i missed too i'm one of the cool things about <laughs> uh listening to video game music is that it tends to loop and usually gives me a second chance to get through it and dig into some 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 stuff i might have missed the first time through M music doesn't always do that when we listen to soundtrack music but uh it happens often enough. It kind of gives it a little bit of an edge as far as analysis goes because it's pretty rare for me to listen to anything twice. It is a first time reaction. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I, I picked up some cool things on that second time around though. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you could see it. That first time I was just grooving, I was jamming with it. There's a very large part of that reaction where I forgot we were listening to soundtrack. For a Sonic game. <laughs> that, is, that is some solid music right there. Um, let's start with the A section, the non-sax solo. I really dig this. Well, let, let me, well actually, let's just start with structure in general. We have like an A, B, C, B technically a D. So we have our A, and this is where most of our general licks come from, then the sax solos, and then we have a section that is sort of a, it's a variation on the A. It utilizes a lot of the similar ideas, especially rhythmic, but it is a brand new section entirely here. There's very little melodically, I would say, that are direct callbacks. So I don't want to call it like, uh, you know, A tick or anything like that. It is C. We're going to give it a brand new letter, even though it does have some callbacks. Then we go to another solo section, and you get you could probably call this D if you wanted to, but it is another sax solo, so I'm just going to call it B, even though it is a totally new solo idea. And then after this, we go to the loop. It is a very mellow section, brings the energy way down. A little bit of a lull, a palate cleanser, so that we can bring it back and start the loop over again. Assuming you're in this level for 5 to 10 minutes. I don't know how long levels are in this Sonic game, but uh, 10 minutes seems to be a bit overkill for most Sonic levels. Although, I might have to do multiple stages per, you know, just being in the arid sand. And then, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not a level-based Sonic game, I don't know. Uh, you're going to be listening to this loop quite a few times. Having that palate cleanser is its a really great idea. In fact, if you listen to some of the best earworms that you... I mean, I think of like Final Fantasy VII battle music, right? That is the one I always go to. I think that is the perfect example of how to make a looping idea that you're going to hear for a long time, especially if you start chasing uh, those uh, the optional bosses, Emerald Weapon and stuff. Those fights are going to take minutes. You're going to listen to this one, uh, you know, 40 second loop so many times. You really need to craft something that doesn't get boring over time. And I, I have found consistently <clears throat> that the best ones are ones that have good ebb and flow. And this track has that. And that lull after the second solo section is really key to creating this almost baseline floor. Very little actually happens there. The volume and layering comes way down. And it does this so we can punch back up into 
the A section again, but also while creating this massive palette cleanser. It is a sharp contrast from everything else. It is not loud, it's not full bodied, it is not really groovy. It sort of just creates this, this foundational layer. Really important part to music, uh, to video game music writing, I think, especially if it's a non controlled section. Like cutscenes, they don't have to be looped. You know how long the cutscene is going to take. You can craft something second by second for it. But if you're crafting a stage theme, battle theme, you don't know how long it's going to play, you have to loop it at some point. You're going to want those lulls. And I think that was a fantastic one. So that's what we have structure wise A, B, C, B. And then the contrast, the lull to bring us to the repetition. So the A and the C, like I said, it's a very catchy riff. Like it's, it's such a catchy little lick and it is groovy and it just makes you want to move your body. It has fantastic rhythmic syncopation to it. It is bright and colorful. Like, I don't know, it's called Arid Sands, right? Nighttime theme. To me, this feels more like a casino theme. This, this has all the makings of uh, like visually representing flashing lights everywhere and lots of sound, lots, it, it's just, it's sonic overload to me. It's it's just pure euphoria in musical form. And maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just my relationship to jazz and really loving things like this. In fact, the more I think about it, how much I love catchy melodies and syncopated rhythms and groove in my rock and metal probably stems from my love of funkier uh, sounds from swing jazz. <laughs> uh yeah. Even playing like um Latin influenced jazz stuff. Lots of uh real brass, heavy, punctuated ideas, bright and dancing and syncopated, like Yeah, I probably owe a lot of my tastes to some of the brighter jazz ideas. Never thought about that before. Anyways, everything in this A section just immediately stands out to me. It is, a, a, a like I said, it's euphoria. It's a dopamine hit of, of audio. It is just bright and fun and colorful and bouncy. And it makes you want to forget everything and just dance. And that comes from the drumming. That comes from the melody. That comes from that sick bass tone. That comes from just every bit of this. And also a lot of the timbre as well. The main melody there does have some lower end brass. I think we do have like a, I don't know if it's a tenor sax playing at the lower end of the register or maybe a berry sax playing a bit at the higher end. Um, could have been a trombone. Uh, no, trombones have very distinct sounds. It, I think it was some sax work. It does fill out a little bit of, low, of the lower end, but everything I remember is the higher end stuff. The flute, the alto sax, the, the trumpets, right? All this bright tone um, and higher range pitches. That's what I remember from that section. And it is just, it's the bright lights. It just, it's sonic overload. It, dra it draws all your attention and says, look at me. Look how fun I am. Don't you want to dance, bro? And... Yeah, I'm here for that. A section is so good, especially coming in after the lull at the repetition of just basically the pure palate cleanser. It's like it's like you've taken a step off the dance floor and you're like, man, that was sort of disorienting. That was, you know, a blur. I don't remember the last minute and a half of my life. And then and you're like, oh, snap, that's my song. You get right back on the dance floor. <laughs> Another minute and a half just gone. <laughs> Uh, it's just, yeah. The C section, as I mentioned, uh, copies a lot of the same ideas. It is also still catchy, although I feel a little less catchy than that A hook. Um, and it's still rhythmically oriented. What I think is really cool is that parts of it almost feel, uh, genty. And I only bring that up because this is like a metal oriented, uh, community. 
But yeah, like everybody kind of comes in on this single rhythmic groove and there's just not a lot of that like ba da ba ba ba. That is McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. But that bounciness, the, the huge jumps in pitch, we get to the C section and the movement is a lot more minute. We're talking only half steps, maybe whole steps. It is sort of just jumping up to the next note in the current chord uh, or in the current scale rather than making these large leaps and having this very acrobatic, powerful sound. A lot of the power here comes from the unification of sound. Everybody's sort of around the same notes, everybody playing this, this syncopated lower rhythm. It is hyper groovy in the same way that Gent is, utilizing similar ideas of sticking around a note, hovering around a home note rather than bouncing all over the place. Um, I think it's a really cool yin and yang situation where they're both doing the same thing. They both want me to groove. They both want me to dance. It's still a lot of sonic information being thrown at me, all of it on the positive side. They just take two very different approaches to it. And I find that balances out a lot of it. If the A section had been the same both times through, it might have increased the fatigue, but having four semi-distinct sections before the lull, once again, as far as video game music goes, is a really great way of going about writing a track that you know the person playing is going to have to listen to over and over and over, especially if they lose the level and have to restart. You know, I mentioned maybe 10 minutes tops, but that's honestly, if you just play the level one time through, if you die multiple times, you're going to be listening to this song for half an hour. It needs to be good. It, there's a lot of weight on that. And I think the general pacing and structure of how they crafted the A and the C section is, um, yeah, it's just wonderful. This takes us to the two jazz solo, uh, to the two sax solos. I enjoyed them. I find it's really cool. Once again, we have two sides of a coin again, a yin and yang thing. The first one is very melodically focused. It's more of a traditional solo focusing on pitch, movement, and harmony. There are some really cool spicy ideas in here. And there's one part, I don't know, it's about halfway through, and he just hits these two notes from outside the key. And I'm like, dang, just is a fantastic choice to utilize those specific notes against what the band is playing at that point. Just... Wonderful. I, I wish I could explain if like if those don'ts don't hit you and I'm sure I put on some staying face and like did the arched back thing. I don't know. Whatever I did there, just go back and listen and like whatever, whatever notes just played, those are the ones that hit me. And I wish I could explain why. It's just, I don't know. It's just one of those spices. It's like a flavor that you really love and you just don't get to eat it every day. Like if, if you don't make your own teriyaki sauce and, you know, obviously you don't buy garbage, you know, teriyaki chicken in a can or something <laughs> that obviously isn't going to taste anywhere near like good home cooked teriyaki. But then like, I don't know, four times a year, you know, once a season or so you go out and you buy a nice plate of, of some teriyaki uh, meat, whatever it is. And you're like, man, that hits the spot every time you might go to this place the same like the third week uh the third wednesday of every third month and you go and order the same thing it's just like perfect every time that's what this is for me these jazzy spicy chords are something that i just crave and i don't get a lot um, as i've been more focused on exploring all this metal stuff and um it just it hits so well every time and he just hit the right combinations of of these notes mm. yeah just like the, the perfect amount of kick to a sauce and i love it um but again it's it's mostly focused on what notes are, are is he playing what notes are, are the, the band playing how's that clashing and what's the melody going here this is a really different take than on the second solo, which is a bit more experimental, although a bit more expressive, I think is probably the right word for it. It's not so much about what notes he plays, but how he plays them. There's a lot of blasting going on on the saxophone. I don't know how that works, okay? <laughs> I could tell you how blasting works on a brass instrument. 
I don't understand how it works on a saxophone. I'm sure it's the same thing. It's about creating these vibrations and making the vibrations very big. And as they move through the horn, they're clashing and they come out the other side with a bit of you know, like, a, like a type of compression on them. It also sounds like there's some trilling going on. But I like I, I can roll my tongue while I play the trumpet. It's a very different texture to this, but it's similar in that there's there seems to be a control over the note. And it's like a fluctuation between two kinds of this note, more so than the chaos that would be created from just sound waves bouncing around and clashing with each other while moving through the horn. So I don't know. I, I I'm not a sax player. In fact, I have never gotten a reeded instrument to work in my life. My sister played sax. I had plenty of opportunities to try. I even went and got my own reed and mouthpiece so that I could try. It doesn't work. Maybe other ones are easier. Maybe a, a clarinet would work for me. I can make noise on a flute. I can play pretty much every brass instrument. They're all sort of the same. French horn's tough. I think I've brought that up before. My, my, my tone, my body to French horn is just garbage. That's all embouchure stuff. Well, I'm sure the, the read stuff. Anyways, the point is, is I don't know how to play a sax. So I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but it's, it's about this growl that he makes with the saxophone and working it into these licks. Again, it's not this melodic idea. It's not an overarching story. It's about creating this feeling, this vibe, letting the emotions out through the instrument. And I find that to be really interesting. One, because it doesn't really clash with everything else, even though I think technically it should. It's a very different vibe from what the rest of the song presents, which is just this fun, uplifting, bouncy stuff. And he's bringing this chaotic energy to it. Um, but it's, it's also just a very different approach to the other solo. And I just, I love that. I don't know if it's a different soloist. Um... I don't know. It's just, I enjoyed it. When I heard the sax come in again, I was like, oh, okay, you know, this isn't going to be bad. I enjoyed that first solo, but kind of hoping for a little trumpet action, you know. But no, I, I ended up enjoying it. It's a very different approach to it, and I thought that was awesome. The other thing i got to give a shout out to before we wrap this up, I know this is a bit on the shorter side. That brass, man. You heard that stinger? It was there at the end. I'm pretty sure it was there at the end of the loop the first time through as well. I just, I must have missed it somehow. Dude, these notes are sharp, crisp, short, and high. Like, dang, I want to know what note that trumpet player is hitting. Because I want to know if I could have hit it. You know. Back in my prime, I, I could work back up there, but I don't think I'd be able to hit it today as rusty as I am. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that is just... And the thing is, too, is it's the difficulty of it. It's not so much about getting to hit that note. Building your range up over time is just a natural part, I think, of being a trumpet player. It's something you just keep pushing for subconsciously, almost. Maybe it was just because we were competitive, you know, back in high school, college, stuff like that. Uh, always trying to improve so you can go up the, 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 the rankings. You know, you don't want to be third trumpet. You want to be first trumpet. You want to have that lead part. You want to have those awesome lines. Well, you want to play those parts. You got to hit those notes too. So, I mean, we'd have competitions. It, it's not even part of like practice. Not like I would go home and be like, all right, man, I got to hit that G above the staff now. No, it'd be like, hey, you know, we got like 15 minutes till school. You want to see who can hit the highest note? <laughs> we just go into the band room and you just hear these trumpets blasting. Because, <laughs> of course, we had poor technique, at least, uh, you know, middle school, high school stuff. Uh, by the end of high school, college, we knew how to, how to reach those notes without screwing anything up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean... I think it's just a part of it. I wonder if people have that kind of drive on their own. I mean, obviously people do just to get better, but like, I don't know where I'm going with any of this. Anyways, it's just a really high note. And I, I'm kind of curious if I could hit, but oh yeah, here's what I was going on. Increasing your range is just something that happens, right? It's not about that. I firmly believe this trumpet player could hit way above that note. The thing is, it's the attack 
it's the instant body. It's not it's not moving into it. It is a knowledge. This is where my muscles need to be in my mouth. This is the type of air support and airflow that I need to hit this note. And then you just pop, pop. You just hit it and come off. And there's no slide into it. There's no growth. It has to be 110% on that beat. And then you got to stop it. Because that's what a stinger is. It can't be weak. It has to be full and powerful and immediate. And this dude just keeps doing it over and over. It is just this perfection. I just, I have a lot of admiration for this dude's skill and precision on the trumpet. <laughs> All right, that wraps up. These are my thoughts on uh, Tomoya Otani's Arid Sands night theme from Sonic Unleashed. Yeah, Sonic Unleashed. This was the game that got a lot of negative press, I think, because uh, it wasn't like a fast Sonic game. He turned into a werewolf or something like that. A werehog. Uh, I think it was like a beat-em-up instead of like, uh, you know, trying to you know, Sonic's got to go fast. And then it's when he just walks slow and he's a, like a hulking beast instead. I just remember a lot of negative press about it. I'll get there eventually. If nothing else, sounds like there's a pretty awesome soundtrack to listen to while I bash my head against the wall trying to find some enjoyment out of this one. <laughs> oh, man. What are your thoughts, though? Did this surprise you as much as it surprised me? Is there anything in here you enjoyed? Anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Maybe you just have your own isolated thoughts about this track. Put all that stuff down in the comments section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for today, but I'll be back tomorrow. We're going to dive into long band names, looking at the Kilimanjaro Dark Jazz, which is pretty cool. Dark Jazz Ensemble. Pretty cool. We're going to get some more jazzy stuff this week. Uh, completely circumstantial. <laughs> That's just... That got what voted in. What That, got, that was the band that got voted in for this uh, theme. And of course... Because they fit the theme, we have to have them between the buried and me. One of these days, I feel like I should just take a week to make an album reaction to all their albums and just be like, no more between the buried and me reactions. Gotta pick something else. I've now listened to everything. And you know what? I'm sure that a lot of fans would enjoy that. Uh, I'm not tired of them, though, which is good. But uh, they are the most reacted to band, and they show up pretty much every time they can. So, just is what it is, I suppose. All right, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.